So, did King Lobengula sell the country for sugar? If you're Zimbabwean, you've probably come across this phrase. But how far true is it? In this video, we'll find out. But before we do that, please consider partnering with me on Patreon. From as little as $3, you can help me keep this channel alive. And on that note, help me thank one of the channel's biggest lifesavers, Tom Bodkin. Thank you so much for the continued support. Before we get into the RAD concession, which Lobengula signed in 1888, it's worth giving a background of what was taking place in Zambezia, as it was known by the European concession seekers, referring to the territories that encompassed parts of South Africa, Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Now, it's now worth noting that the area surrounding the Great Zimbabwe had for centuries been referred to as Zimbabwe. You can watch my video on the history of the Great Zimbabwe. I'll leave a card above. The Ndebele King Mzilikazi landed in what is now Matebeleland in the late 1820s. And no sooner had he landed, European hunters, missionaries, and gold mining concession seekers would approach him trying to get his approval to carry out their business in the territory he had occupied. In December 1859, Zilikazi allowed the first missionaries from the London Missionary Society under the leadership of Robert Moffat to set up a mission station at Inyati. In 1868, Zilikazi gave miners and prospectors the right to mine gold but not to own the land in the Tati district. This is the same year Zilikazi would also die. In his place, Lowengula Kumalo, his son, would ascend to the throne amidst a lot of opposition in 1870. In the same year, he would agree to the Tati concession, giving the London and Limpopo Mining Company rights to mine in the Tati River area, the area located between the Zimbabwe and Botswana border. In 1870, Lowengula would grant Thomas Baines a concession on behalf of the South African Gold Fields Exploration Company to explore for gold between Gweru and Unyani, now Manyame Rivers. Baines would eventually die in 1875. In 1880, the Tati concession with the London and Limpopo Mining Company was revoked for failure to pay the agreed £60 annual fee and awarded instead to the Northern Light Gold and Exploration Company, a syndicate formed by Daniel Francis, Samuel Edwards and others. In the 1880s, Lobengula would grant fewer concessions than the previous decade, perhaps wearied by the incessant European concession seekers, or those scholars believe he was now sure of his position as king and had no one to please. In 1884, he would sign another concession with a syndicate made up of Lisk, Phillips, West Beach, and Fairbairn to dig for gold and other minerals between the Gwaii and Manyame rivers, the same area granted to Thomas Baines in 1871. In the late 1880s, Cecil John Rhodes was developing a keen interest in the area between Zambezi and Limpopo, perhaps to expand his mining interests through the De Beers Consolidated Mines. But Rhodes himself had a bigger plan of colonizing the whole continent from Cape to Cairo, and Lobengula was the first hurdle he had to overcome. As a build-up to the Rad concession, Rhodes funded Moffat to persuade King Lobengula to sign a treaty of friendship with Britain. The document was signed on the 11th of February 1888. This will come to be known as the Moffat Treaty. In a letter written to Sir Sidney Shepard, resident commissioner of Bechuana Land Protectorate, modern-day Botswana, between 1885 and 1895. Rhodes on the 14th of August, 1888 wrote, My plan is to give Chief Lobengula whatever he desires, and also to offer Her Majesty's government the whole expense of good government. If we get Matebele land, we shall get the balance of Africa. I do not stop my ideas at Zambezi. Rhodes and Alfred Bate had in June of that year put together a team consisting of Charles Rudd, Francis Thompson, and Rochefort Maguire to go and negotiate with Lowengula. Rhodes was trying to fend off competition from another grouping called the London Syndicate. Charles Rudd was the head of the negotiating team, whilst Thompson was included because of his knowledge of the Setswana language, and Maguire was a barrister from Ireland who was included to add a touch of class, although later on he would prove to be a liability to the group. After encountering many hurdles on the road, Rad and his party arrived at Umvucha, the King's Crow, on the 21st of September 1888. They presented the King with £100 in gold sovereigns and were told to return a few days later. On the 24th of September, the party was finally granted audience with the Ndebele King, and Thompson explained in Setswana that they were not Boers, but English, and they were only interested in mining in the Mashonaland region, but Lobengula was not interested. 
In the following weeks, intermittent talks were held, but nothing fruitful came out of them. The king was consulting his council of Izinduna and Moffat, who was a missionary entrusted by Lobengula, unknowing to the king that he was also on Rhodes' payroll. Since Lobengula was illiterate, he would utilize missionaries and other European guests who frequented his crow to interpret documents for him. He would ask a different person to draw up the documents and another to interpret what would have been drawn up. That way he would make sure that his position would be clear in the agreements before he used his seal which was made in England for him to authenticate the document. Cecil John Rhodes also robbed in Sir Sidney Shepard who advocated on his behalf to Lebengula by saying Rhodes was the only one with the financial capacity to protect the Ndebeles from the Boers down south, a subject he knew Lobengula would be concerned with. Rad's group was eventually granted audience with the Izinduna, the king's ruling council. William Helm, who was part of the London Missionary Society, was asked by King Lobengula to interpret. He had established the London Missionary Society at Hope Fountain, annoying to him that he was also in support of Rhodes' plan. He was hoping that it would give him more success in his missionary work. The Ndebele had up to that time proved to be resistant to his gospel. Thompson, who was doing much of the negotiating by the way, suggested to his colleagues that they change strategy with the Izinduna, who seemed not interested in the 10,000 pounds worth of gold sovereigns they had with them. The trio observed and concluded that guns and ammunition might be more appealing to the king. They eventually offered the king 1,000 Martini rifles and 100,000 rounds of ammunition and a gunboat on the Zambezi River. These never materialized, by the way. Thompson eventually managed to get the king to sign with the help of Loche, one of the Izinduna, whom he had befriended. Those who signed the document with Lobengula were Rudd, Thompson, and Maguire. Helm and Dreyer also signed as witnesses. Within hours, Dreyer and Rudd were on the road to Kimberley with the signed concession. Thompson and Maguire were instructed to stay behind in Bulawayo, basically to guard their interests since other white concession seekers were camped there trying to get concessions from Lebengula. Rudd and Rhodes eventually traveled to Cape Town to present the concessions to Hercules Robinson, the High Commissioner, who wanted the concessions to be published at once. But Rhodes had to create a copy of the concessions that did not include the 1,000 Martini rifles, as that would possibly meet resistance, as he would be seen as arming the natives. He would later post the amended concessions two days later. No sooner had the concession been published, that King Lobengula started receiving news that he had sold the nation to Thompson and crew from white concession seekers that frequented his crow. This news did not go down well with the Izinduna, who started asking Lobengula difficult questions. The king summoned Thompson to the crow. He was interrogated by the Izinduna for 10 hours. He denied all the allegations, but the news of the concession kept welling up until the blame was placed on Loche, who had supported Thompson to get the concession signed by convincing Lobengula that basically it was a good idea. He was executed, and 300 of his family and followers were also executed that very night. Relations between Maguire, Thompson, and the Ndebele were strained afterwards. But Thompson was forced by Rhodes to stay put till he had succeeded in getting the British endorsement for their cause. Lobengula demanded to see the concession he signed from Thompson, whom he referred to as Thomason, who exclaimed that he was making efforts for the concession to return. To make matters worse, Maguire began suffering from indigestion. He was basically homesick. On one occasion, he decided to go and bath in Lobengula's drinking fountain, which was sacred. He was brushing his teeth and spitting into the river. He was captured by one of Lobengula's warriors, called Tabeni, who ended up confiscating his bag of toiletries. Maguire would later on decide to leave, and Thompson was left with all the trouble of dealing with the king and the Ndebele people who were no longer in good books with him. Lobengula's mother would eventually die, and other white concession seekers decided to pin the death on Maguire and Thompson by insinuating that the toothpaste he had spit into the river was poison, which had killed the king's mother. The killing of Loche did not ease pressure on Lobengula from the Izinduna. The Ndebele king eventually sent Babayane and Mshete with Edward Arthur Mount the Explorer, who also had dispute with the Rad Concession to England to meet with the Queen with the letter from Lobengula. The letter read, To Her Majesty, Queen Victoria from Lobengula. Some time ago, a party of white men came into my country, the principal one appearing to be a man named Rad. They asked me for a place where they could dig for gold, and I said, 
they would give me certain things for the right to do so. I told them to bring it to me and I would see what I would do. A document was read and presented to me for signature. I asked what it contained and was told that it were my words and the words of those men. I put my hand to it. About three months after, I heard from other sources that I had given the right to all the minerals in my country. I called a meeting of my Indunas and of the white men and demanded a copy of the document. It was proof to me that I had signed away the right to minerals of the whole country to Rad and his friends. I have since had a meeting of my Indunas and they will not recognize the paper as it contains neither my words nor the words of those who got it from me. The queen also responded to Lobengula saying, in the first place, the queen wishes Lobengula to understand distinctly that English men who have gone out to Matebele land to ask leave to dig for stones have not gone with the queen's authority and that he should not believe any statements made by them to that effect. The queen advises Lobengula not to grant hastily concessions of land or leave to dig, but to consider all applications very carefully. It is not wise to put too much power into the hands of the men who come first and to exclude other deserving men. A king gives a stranger an ox, not the whole head of his cattle. However, in October 1889, without further communication with Lobengula, the company's charter was granted. I'll leave a link below so you can read the full letters on your own. Rhodes eventually managed to appease the concession seekers, including Mount. He eventually sent the concession to Thompson with the instruction that he was to release it only when he had a knife to his throat. So he hid it in a pumpkin gourd. Thompson's relations with the king and his people were strained that he had to flee for his life. He later found himself in the Kalahari Desert, eventually made his way to Mafikeng, but Rhodes forced him to return to Bulawayo where he eventually presented the document to Lobengula, who was glad to see it and felt vindicated. Lobengula returned the concession to Thompson. What would transpire next, you can watch my video on the history of Harare. So, did King Lobengula sell the nation for sugar? The resounding answer is, obviously not. See you in the next video.